Thank you, John Schwab. Thank you. Uh, as I've been doing these interviews, and I, I told I told John Durza this, like as, a, uh, as we're doing these interviews, there's many, many, many people refer to you. And the fact that nobody said one mean thing means something. So you, you apparently you lived a good life in some way. As, uh, about know, me? Like, nobody said anything mean about me. Yeah, I know. It's like even I have enemies. Wow. <laughs> so thank you for my, being here. I want to get enemies, your story. My, my enemies are going to be very disappointed with that. Yeah, that right, right, right. So thank you for being here. Um, yeah. How are you doing? You're you're doing great guns now. From the well, we're promise. we're getting back at it. You know, we yeah. we uh, 2019 McGuffey Lane did about 42 gigs, and last year we had uh, 27 booked. When we got cut off in March, we only did two. Uh -huh. uh, so that was a, a big hit. And then this year, it's because it started so late. You know, a lot of the festivals and fairs and theaters and stuff that we do with that band uh that people were afraid to book you know so yeah but it's picking up now now that the governor lifted the health rules and uh you know the cdc came out and said that uh, you don't need to wear a mask if you're vaccinated uh, uh just like the day that happened we got six gigs i think okay so it's looking up things are looking okay. up man yeah that's good that's good are you vaccinated <laughs> are we what are you vaccinated i absolutely am yes okay. absolutely yeah. for as okay. soon as i could the yeah, fast as I could. And, you know, I was a little tenuous about it because, I mean, I've been playing professionally for 51 years and I've never had a, you know, people always ask me when I was going to retire. And as after being forced into retirement for nine months out of the last uh, 15, I, I decided that uh, I'm not interested in retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> retirement for, for those who do stuff that they don't like doing. Yeah, exactly. I'm, yeah. I'm lucky. I'm lucky to be able to do what I love all my life. Yeah, so, you, 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 know. you, you like me, have a, a skirted uh, responsibility into everyday job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, how'd you get your start? Like, go way back in the beginning. Way back in the beginning. Well, you know, my my grandpa gave me a guitar, I, and and I I enjoyed it so much. It was like an old harmony or something, and the mm -hmm. strings were that far off the neck and. Uh, you know, my, I would play it on my fingers bled. And I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just sitting in my room doing it. You know, no one give me, gave me any instructions. And that's how I really got started. Then I, you know, put together the, the little typical band in the seventh grade, you know, the basement bands and garage mm -hmm. bands. And, and we played little gigs and, uh, you know, uh, just kept going. I mean, I was, I was just, you know, my, my mom was a, was a big, uh, she, she loved music mm -hmm. and she would sing to me when I was little and she she's the one who turned me on to the Beatles my mom okay. she said I, I I remember sitting there we were on Westerville Road and Dog and Sons driving was on the right uh -huh. my mom and dad were on, on front seat me and my sister in the back seat my mom turned around and looked at me and said Johnny have you ever heard of the Beatles and I went no she said she turned it up you know and that was uh, that was uh, after that it was uh, off to the races yeah my, my my parents didn't know anything about that but the, the... So the Beatles were your earliest influence, would you say? Or no, no, no. I mean, I, I liked like you know the Ventures and uh, Lonnie Mac and uh, the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. All that stuff was pre pre Beatles. Yeah. I mean, I even liked you know I mean like uh, Peter Paul and Mary and you know real you know back then uh, the, the top station would play Johnny Cash and then you know uh, you, you know there's some rock and roll with Elvis and and you know Andy Williams and, and mm -hmm. I mean it was you know it was you got a diverse uh, type yeah, of, yeah, you know, yeah a, a and Motown, Motown and all that stuff, and, and, and I, I like that. And that's so that might, you know, if you come and hear me play a, a gig where I'm doing a lot of cover tunes, it, mm -hmm. we go from from one musical right turn to a sharp musical left turn. You know, yeah. we'll play Johnny Cash, then we'll play Frank Sinatra. That's the yeah. way to be. That's yeah. the way to be. It's like uh, so. Who? How early was uh? Your earliest bands. Let's talk about your earliest bands. Well, we had a band called Danny and the Continentals. In the, I think I was in the seventh grade. Okay. And Danny was a singer, mm -hmm. but I mean, none of us were any good. But Danny was particularly couldn't sing, and so we got uh, a guy named Joe Higginbotham to be our singer, who who ended up playing in a really good band called the, the Monster Band later on. Mm -hmm. But but we kept we still called it Danny and the Continentals, even though Danny was gone. Okay. So <laughs> that was our. That was a seven, and then we had a band. And then I joined up with uh, when I was in the ninth grade. 
John Durso, uh, who, uh, you know, he, I think you've interviewed a few yeah. times. He, uh, his band was needing a guitar player. I didn't know him, but some girl I knew knew them. Mm -hmm. And so he I was went. the sax player. He was the sax player. Mm -hmm. And we went to his house over on the river. I, I hadn't met any of the guys. And I played a gig with them the first night. I was in the ninth grade. And I played with those guys, you know, through high school. Uh, and and I, that, you know, John was really, he says he's a sax player, but he was the lead vocalist, really. Okay. He was a great singer back then. I, I don't know why he quit singing, but uh, he was a great vocalist. And then when he went away to college, uh, we, we kept going and I just kind of started singing by default. And that's how I started as a singer. Yeah. Uh, was when thanks. So thanks, John, for going to college. Thanks for not flunking out of high school. So now I've been singing. <laughs> you have a career since. because of it. And then I went, I, I did go away to college uh, for my freshman year. And, uh, you know, I was majoring in draft evasion. It was during the Vietnam War, yeah. you know, and uh, that's when and, you started wearing a dress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you saw those pictures? Yes. Yes. Oh, OK. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> That May, which was 51 years ago this month, uh, Kent State happened, and they sent us all home. Uh, school was closed, even though I was at OU. Uh, the, the riots were bad down there, too. They sent us all home, and I'm sitting in my mom's house, you know, twiddling my thumbs up in the attic, going, what am I going to do? And a guy called me up from a, a lounge band called the Mickey Wilson Trio. They needed a guitar player. That summer, I went on the road, and we we – we're up in Wisconsin and Michigan all mm -hmm. summer long. It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So uh, did did that for a, a year and a half or so, and then the the four uh, the three of us guys that were playing behind him decided to start our own band called Hokey Bear, okay. which was another lounge band. Which we played all over the country. We played from New York to Chicago. San when you Francisco. say lounge, what kind of what what's the set list look like? Nine to two. It was all cover songs, uh, but we were like you know we were stuck between the you know the hippie movement and the, and and the uh rat pack you know we had we all had uh, custom we, we had tailor-made suits that we all wore that were matching and we had a girl singer that we, we were we were pretty dressed up and mm -hmm. uh, snazzy you know but it, it you know i was only 20 when we started that and we i mean you know, we were playing in towns i never thought i'd see yeah. which was a lot of fun mm -hmm. and then when when that ended i i just went off playing solo Mm -hmm. And I did and uh, did a little acoustic duo for a couple of years playing the the uh, you remember steak and ale the bar, the oh, restaurant yeah. Yeah. we we played those all over the country okay. for a couple of years and then uh, you know I had gotten sick of the band scene because you know you've you've heard enough stories to know that the, the band drama is always there yeah yeah and so it's, it's always part of the thing so I had mm -hmm. decided I wasn't going to play solo anymore or i wasn't gonna be in a band anymore then i got with uh, jd blackfoot okay. uh, for, for a couple years and then i was opening up for um mcguffey lane uh, when they asked me to join them yeah in, uh, I, I just found out today that you weren't the, like a founding member like no. it existed before you got there who is well uh, i mean it, it depends george on what mobley? you think george mobley it, he was uh he was in jd blackfoot Okay. Uh, with, with he's the one that got me in JD Black, but okay. he was like when I was just like, uh, you know, when I was like a eighth grade, he was like you know, a junior in high school. That's a big difference back then. He was yeah. the first garage band I ever saw, so he yeah. was my hero. Okay. You know? And Michael Shortland was even older than him. Oh, sorry about that. And uh, Michael Shortland uh, was who ended up in Strongbow uh, okay. and played with uh, the Dantes and went on the road with. Uh, uh, he he was a Myler hero. Those were my high school okay. guitar heroes. Okay, so were you ever? Did you ever play with uh, uh, Durzo in either of those bands? Or actually, you were in in uh, in no, JD just in Black high school. Huh? No, he Not wasn't in JD. School. He wasn't in JD Blackfoot when I. Uh, and you were. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, well, he was. I mean, John John was in JD Blackfoot, but before yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they had a lot of JD had a lot of musicians come and go. So yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, so JD Blackfoot. Okay, so you were in that band for a couple of years. So yeah. how did they? Why? What? What changed your mind about playing in a band? Well, I mean, JD, you know, he had a record deal with Fantasy Records, and when the record didn't take off, he just he didn't want to do. He didn't want to play 
He didn't want to get in the trenches. JD, if JD could play big concerts, he didn't want to do it, which would be great if he could pull it off. But he, uh, so we, the band that was back in JD, we became a group called Bandit. We were playing at like places like the Sugar Shack. That's when I started writing. And that was George Mobley and Bud Fowler and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Billy Carroll and myself. And uh, we, uh, you know, I started writing with that band. And then when that band broke up, I, that's when I really decided I didn't want to be in a band. I was opening up for McGuffey Lane at the, uh, the castle, which became Zachariah's Red Eye Saloon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people say, oh, I can't believe you weren't one of the original members. Yeah, I, I've only been there since 77. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I'm one of the newer guys. No, what I'm saying, I've been, <laughs> I've been hearing about you like for, for months. Yeah. And as a name that is synonymous with McGuffey Lane. Okay. So you're like the vibe of that band. Okay. So I, I just found out today because I was doing my research <laughs> that you, that, that the band started in like 1972 or something. Yeah. 72 yeah. or something. I think it was 74 actually. Okay, but, 74. Well, the two guys that the original members had a, a duo called Scotch and Soda. And then in 74, they, they added a couple pieces and changed it to McGuffey Lane. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so you join uh, McGuffey Lane. Did they have a recording contract or? No, no. Were they doing original music when you joined them? Yeah, they were doing half originals and half covers. Okay. And um, I picked up on, you know, I kept working on my songwriting at that point. Mm -hmm. I ended up having three songs on the first album. One, which was the, the, the single that, that really, really did well for us. Yeah. Uh, we sold like, you know, 40,000 copies in, in Ohio in, in, a, in four weeks. Yeah. And, and then it got to that, that, that was on the what, release. What song was that? Long Time Loving You, it's called. Okay. And, and, and uh, but the album was called McGuffey Lane, self titled. But we put it out on a, some friends of ours had a, pr a promotion company called Paradise Island. And, and they helped us get it out there and they got, got us some nice distribution through Ohio that allowed us to sell those albums. Yeah. And so at the time, uh, the uh, Rolling Stones, uh, uh, had an album out uh, and uh, Atlantic Records back then it was before before they had scan you know uh, and so yeah, they yeah. would call the, the record labels would call out to the to the record stores and say you know who's number one and so it was they kept saying it kept here in McGuffey Lane all through the Midwest and, and it's oh. more of the Stones well Stones are number two so Atlantic Records was intrigued by that and called us up and then signed us to the deal and so yeah, uh, the, the the record then was released on it was first on Paradise Island, then released on Atco. Yeah, and we sold another 160, 180 thousand copies. That's wonderful. And then that we we cool. also had a four record deal, so that was great. That was really yeah. fun. So so how long did that last? That was well. We got signed in eighty. Uh, we we had uh, four four records. We took us through eighty five. Okay. But yeah. but during the during the making of our fourth album, one of our key members. Steve uh, Douglas was killed in a car wreck coming home from our sold out show in Hare Arena in Dayton. Uh, so it was like the, one of the best nights of our careers, one of the worst nights of our careers. Yes. That was kind of a, it put the skids on things a little bit right there. Yeah. So, uh, um, so what happened then after? Well, we, we, after your, you know, you had a record deal, you were touring all over the United States. Did you do the, uh, you did Europe too? No, no, we just did the United States. We, we were signed to a, a, the Empire Agency and they, their main act were Allman Brothers, Charlie Daniels Band, Marshall Tucker and Atlanta Rhythm Section. So we were always out with one of those guys, you know, mm -hmm. and then we played five uh, Charlie Daniels volunteer jams too. So it was a lot of fun, you know, it was, it, you know we, we, were, we were rocking. And then once the record deal went away and teams had died, and then one of the other guys, um, one of the other guys, the, the main, the other main songwriter uh, had quit the band. And then we put out a, a live album from, uh, we recorded at the uh, Newport Music Hall in Columbus called Live on High Street. Mm -hmm. And that did real good for us. We sold, I think, 50,000 copies of that record. And that got us, that, that gave us a little boost again. That was on an independent label that we, uh, you know, local uh, Ohio label okay. called Rephrase. And then, but it's just, you know, and then, and then the, the guy that quit the band killed himself. Um, 
Bob and Nally killed himself and it was a big hubbub. Um, and it just kind of, so about 1990, we just decided to hang it up for a while. Okay. How long were you? Uh, you well, had... I, yeah, I had a, I had a uh, person that uh, I put together a four song demo and um, the, uh, the guy I pitched it to really liked it a lot. And he said that if you, you know, if you could, we could release this on the, uh, under the name of McGuffey Lane, you have a record deal. So I, I didn't own it, the name. I, it was owned between the three original members. Uh -huh. So at that point, I, I, I reached out to them and ended up buying the name from the other two uh, founding members. And uh, by the time I got all that done, the record, the record deal disappeared. That okay. was in 94. And then so in 96, uh, I decided to put it out on my own. Okay. It, was, it was the album called Call Me Lucky. Okay. So we, we started playing again in '96 with okay. a different, a different lineup. Who was that lineup? Who was who was in that lineup? <laughs> that was uh, okay. Casey McEwen was on keyboards and he was on the, in in the band when we broke up. Mm -hmm. He was in there. Uh, Randy Huff was on drums. Um, on uh, on bass was Molly Pockin, and uh, uh, we had a piano player which was Casey and then myself. So Molly Molly is the uh... She's the she's the force. I'm hearing about all these things about her. I, I heard her guitar playing. I heard her uh, mandolin playing. Oh yeah, she's it's, okay. Uh, I hear she's a drummer. Yep. <laughs> she's, she's jack my, of, a jack she's of my guardian uh, angel, things. man. My huh? musical guard. My musical guardian angel. Yes. Molly. Yes. You're you're lucky. You're a lucky man. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so, uh, um. So that band, okay. So, some of the some of the videos that I was watching. Who's the bass player? I guess. Okay, so so you know we started that. We were, we did that ninety six to about two thousand with that new lineup, and then I got the two original members back in the band in the early. Um, uh, did you lose me? There yeah. we go. Uh, in the and uh, in, in the early two thousand, the two original members, Terry Fall. And Steve Reese came back, Steve on bass and Terry on steel guitar. Mm -hmm. And they're still they're still there. So of the three, the three remaining original members of McGuffey Lane, only three are alive and we're all still in the band. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our our original drummer passed away too. So okay. Who's the bass player? Bass player's name is Steve Reese. Okay. Okay. Is he original? Yeah, he's he lived on McGuffey Lane in Athens, Ohio, which is where the the name, name came from. from. Okay. Yeah. So he's and, like and Terry Efall is also from Athens, Ohio. They were they were you know schoolmates and had little bands in element and uh, junior high and stuff. Yeah. And then they were the original guys. Those mm -hmm. two. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he, I like his playing. He's he's got a good. Uh, he fills it up and it, uh, he does a lot of yeah. I was watching your videos. So um, so uh. What are you doing these days? Because I know not all of your stuff is McGuffey Lane. No, I play a lot of stuff. Um, you know, like 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 la last week I did a songwriters thing at Natalie's here in Columbus with Haddon Sarah, who um, who plays with Ruthie Foster. I don't know if you're hip to who she is. Mm -hmm. uh, great blues, she's Grammy winning blues blues uh, singer, mm -hmm. fantastic. He also plays with Phil Dirt and the Dozers, who we go on that cruise with. We, it's a this would have been our eighth year on this cruise, decades of rock and roll cruise. But so I play, I do like songwriting things and I do solo gigs where I'm just playing my favorite cover tunes, but mostly just the, the duo right now with, with Molly. Okay. But, but we got to Lane starting up again in, uh, in June. Okay. So, uh, okay. So uh, as far as let's talk about this, the Columbus music scene, which you're a very, you know everybody, so what, yeah. is, what makes what makes that uh, music scene so kind of dynamic? What do you think? Why, why do you think? Because uh, these are lifetime friendships. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, what can you tell me? There's there's always been a lot of gigs available. I mean, when I started, I was playing six nights a week. You know, nine to two, uh, and and my you know I, I, I've always come back here. Even when we're on the road, I would return to. Ohio and Columbus and um just I, I would have to say more than anything it's the it's the fan 
base that's just so loyal and and you know you, without that you really can't play gigs i mean yeah. you can go play gigs to empty rooms if you want to but so, it's not too much fun yeah <laughs> you know, I've, I've done it believe me i have done it plenty all right yeah so uh anything in the um who were some of the club owners that it did, did any of them help you out or did oh man yeah i've had a lot of support from club owners and uh you know scott steinecker at, at uh, uh you know down there at he, he he bought the agora back in the 80s and he's he's been a big supporter of mcguffey lane all along and mm -hmm. uh he he uh, also owns a place called the uh express Lim uh express live which is downtown it used to be called promo west pavilion and we've been doing a gig there every january for 20 years it sells out that's it's like about a 2500 seat hall mm -hmm. and uh, we we do that with him and um but you know, I also owned a recording studio for like since '92, yeah. so that that kept that kept me in touch with a lot of musicians and kept me in touch with a lot of younger musicians. Okay. Uh, have you so have, I, have I, you have you passed on the helping the younger younger musicians up? Well, we have a lot, a lot we had a lot of young musicians come through there, and we you know, uh, we, we, you know a lot of people were very impressed with the you know the sound that they got, and mm -hmm. it was it, it's, it's still going. We're still, we're still. What, going. What's the name of the studio? John Schwab Recording. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> so you got a name. You got a name. You're also a jingle writer. I have written some jingles. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. How much writing do you do? Well, I. I Is that something you actually? This year, last year, I've done a lot more than usual. I, I started writing with uh, a guy I wrote with back in the day, Dan Tyler, who had number ones for Kenny Rogers, the, the Dirt Band. Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. He, uh, oh guy, uh, he had songs uh, by Abba. Uh, he's been all over the place. He's, it, it, him and I wrote a lot of songs, but all the hits he had, him and I, him and mine weren't one of them back in those okay. days. But he he reached out to me a couple of years ago. And we started writing uh, about a year ago, and we've written four or five songs that I'm real excited about, mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we're going to do something in the fall with those. Do you ever go out? And do you ever take these to like Nashville or something? How do you how would you shop those songs? Most, most you know what we're any more shopping. I you know we're we're just gonna try and put it out and do the viral thing nowadays. You know, I mean yeah. the the last few uh, last few uh, distribution deals I had, I you know I got slammed by the the big corporation. They you know this they just don't pay the little guy. You know they uh -huh. sold a lot of records and they, they just choose not to pay you. And, then the lawyer tells you, well, it's not worth going after. Yeah. I'm so sure you've heard I, that I, story before. Yeah, I've lived that story. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, I'm self publishing, self promoting, self doing. Yeah. Or it doesn't get done because, uh, yeah, I make a percentage of a percentage. Exactly. And that's like, I, if I'm going to fail, it's going to be <laughs> my fault. <laughs> On I, your I, shoulders. I'm not so, somebody's making money off of me. I, I, I understand completely. I understand because you got, solo albums you've done some uh, well albums. yeah and, and when the band was breaking up i got signed to a record called a record label called sasapa records which jd blackfoot was the president of and it was a well-funded uh uh record label i had kenny uh kenny aronoff playing drums on the, my album and i had some real real top shelf musicians that studio cats that we brought in and uh and, and they they did a uh, you know, music video for MTV that was on film and it had the whole deal. It was like a hundred thousand dollar video. And, and then when it finally got time to, for the record to come out, uh, the, the label folded. So, but it was a lot of fun. So I got yeah. to do that. Is that the video you sent me? Yeah. The, the black and white one. Yeah. Yeah. That kind yeah. of reminded me of Kenny Aronoff or the John Cougar kind of sound or, or. Oh, that uh, was him. Yeah, I or, or, uh, had a Bob Bob Seger kind of vibe. Yeah, Midwest. Well, I'm a Midwest rocker, so yeah, you know. yeah. So that that, that was, was that was more of the rock side of me than the country or folky side. You know, I mean, what 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 side of you is the was is the heaviest, or does it depend on the song and the the hour? <laughs> you know, I, I probably lean more towards uh, like really. I mean, the ballads, the stuff I write is is uh, pretty like you know heartfelt like. You know, ballad type stuff, but I'm and a lot of it's very sad. But I'm 
I'm not a sad guy. I always tell people that I'm, not, you know, I'm not a sad guy, but I write sad songs. Yeah, it's it's like the blues. The yeah. blues isn't just about sadness. It's about a you know, realizing what what it is and overcoming it, kind of. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, uh, well, thank you, John. I don't know you got you got somewhere you need to be. So, uh, it's what are you what are you up to in 2021? What's the rest of the year have in store for you? Well, we are we are booked to the hilt right now. We're uh, a lot of patios and stuff like that. Uh, I, I'm going to keep working on the uh, songwriting for uh, uh, that project I'm working on with Dan, and we're yeah. we're going to start playing McGuffey Lane gigs again and uh, see where that takes us. I mean, we're just you know I'm one foot in front of the other uh, musician. You know, I, I, this is my 51st year without you know ever having a real job. So I've That's been. Wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying it, man. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Are you still in touch with JD Blackfoot? Uh, you know, it's funny. I tried to I tried to text him today. Today I tried to text him okay. because uh, he he produced an album on Pure Prairie League back in '87, and I, uh, I I got to sing background on like a few songs, like four songs, like with Nicolette Larson. I don't know if you remember Nicolette Larson and, and Gary Burr, and uh, I think I was singing on Amy and a couple other songs, and. Uh, uh, he, JD pr produced that album and I found one on the internet. So I tried to call him up or let him know that I found uh, one of those albums. Mm -hmm. And I, so I bought it, but I didn't even have a copy of it and I was on it, you know. Oh, yeah. But uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I was hoping to get in touch with him today. So the answer to your question is no, All I'm right. not in touch with my kid. I don't know if he changed his number or what, you know. Okay. All right. All righty. Well, so thank you so much. And uh, um, yeah, this has been a pleasure. This has hey, been a pleasure. Bye. And nice say hello to, to you, your, man. Hello to your family. Okay, thank you, man. <laughs> All righty. Be well. Have a good one. Okay.